So I will also record uh, this presentation so that we can make it available to all the other students. So um, first of all, I'm so excited to see so many of you here and to see uh, just such uh, young, bright, excited faces and also to see that the ratio of men to women is actually uh, decent. Because <laughs> uh, it's, not, it's not the case in many fields of science, unfortunately. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is EECS, uh, which is sort of one of the most popular majors at MIT. And uh, within it, CSAIL, which is the biggest lab at MIT, actually I should say for ECS, the most popular uh, major, and 67, which is, uh, what, the coolest major? <laughs> a computational biology form from more broadly at MIT. So uh, e ECS is humongous. It is the giant monolith uh, in, our, uh, in our school. So it's 140 faculty, 1,700 students, 700 PhD students. It's huge and it's very easy to sort of feel that oh you know i'm going to be like one tiny face in hundreds of other people but i think the main thing that i want you to take away is that you are we, we're a community of communities basically there's a lot of sort of very tight-knit collaborations and integration and sort of interactions that you will find within eecs and everyone has a face and everybody's face uh, is connected so you should not feel uh, lost within this uh, huge major this is the size of the major so basically, you can see here, 6-1 uh, is EE, uh, and then 6-2 is EECS, and then 6-3 is CS. And you can see this ginormous growth of computer science. The orange line is 6-7, which is probably the one that you guys are uh, the most interested in. So this has been hovering around 25 students for the last so many years since its creation. And that's by design. That's sort of the goal of uh, what we're trying to, to achieve because it's a, it's a very specialized set of people that require a, a balance of both computer science and biology. So a lot of the degree programs for, follow a very similar structure within e ECS. So basically we start out with introductory subjects, which basically introduce students to the breadth of the department and teach fundamental skills for e and electrical engineering and computer science. And we have foundation subjects. So the, uh, as a sophomore, you basically take intro and foundation as a junior, you take foundation and header. And as a, as a senior, you take header plus advanced. So basically the foundation subject to build on this introductory material in your software and junior year, and then lead to the header subjects, which basically uh, you know, sort of set up the foundation for uh, all of these um, courses. And sort of the build on the foundation projects, and then they sort of lead to all of the advanced uh, undergrad subjects. So these are the a AUSs, and then they build on the header material. Everybody with me so far? So basically there's additional electives and communication subjects which are, which are typically taken alongside these headers. And then there's many paths, depending on whether you are 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, 6.7, or more recently 6.14, you can take many different paths. So for 6.1, this is EECS, and then this is the introductory subjects, then the foundational subjects, so introductory differential equations, intro to X, uh, programming skills, the foundations are circuit signals, computational structures, and then the header subjects are electromagnetism, nanoelectronics, cellular uh, systems, signal, uh, electromagnetics, machine learning, and so forth. And then that leads to several advanced undergrad subjects. Ready with me? So that's six one. That's EE. On the EECS side, so the dual sort of both EE and CS, we basically again have these foundational subjects, which are sort of uh, spread into these three areas. On one hand, the computer science, on the other side, the EE, and on the third side, you know, in the middle, the e ECS. And then you can see here how these are uh, building on top of each other, basically. For 6.3, uh, which is, again, the most popular major at MIT, uh, computer science, you basically have this, uh, you know, programming, discrete math, and intro to X as the foundation, as the introductory subject, and the foundations are 6004, 6006, and programming. So this is algorithms, programming, and computational uh, structures. And then on top of that, you basically have the header subjects that then lead you to the advanced areas. And the header subjects are AI and machine learning, so 6034 or 6036, computer systems, 6033, uh, software construction, and then algorithms uh, and computation. Okay, And then you lead to a series of advanced subjects. Okay? The one that you guys are most uh, interested in probably is computer, computer science and molecular biology. So again, a, a play on, on numbers, uh, typically with your passion, so six, seven, uh, basically CS and bio. So you basically have the core uh, foundations on computer science building up that stack. 
and then the core foundation of biology and chemistry for molecular biology. Okay, so you have discrete math, programming, algorithms, introductory algorithms, and then advanced algorithms, and of course, communications. And then on the other side, you basically have uh, thermodynamics, orgo, intro lab, and then biochem, genetics, cell biology, and then that's when you get to the computation biology restricted to electrics and the biology restricted to electrics. Sounds good? And I'm going to spend a little more time on those. Everybody with me so far? More recently, we have a 614 side of our department. There's now a 69 being counted. So for those of you interested in neuroscience and computational uh, sciences, uh, stay tuned because there's a cool new major starting soon, so 669. But basically, 614 is now uh, economics and computer science. And again, it follows the same idea of sort of building on the computation as you're building on the economics and then leading to these advanced topics. Everybody with me so far? So now let's dive into 6-7. So basically, what are a typical semesters? So basically, again, this is now flipped. So in your first semester, you'd be taking programming and discrete math. Second semester, more programming and then orgo and thermodynamics. Then an intro lab and into genetics. And then biochem algorithms, cell biology algorithms. Uh, so that's 606, 606. And then the computational biology and biology sort of uh, subjects. Everybody with me? So let's dive more into those. So again, these are the requirements for the 6-7 major. So two introductory subjects from those, one discrete math, two CS foundational subjects, two chemistry subjects, one introductory lab subject, three bio foundational subjects, and then two electives for, from CompBio and from BioRE. Yeah. Um, so for introductory subjects, is this one the uh, there's a lot of petitioning that is possible. So if it's not on the list, chances are you can petition for it. Uh, for example, there's this new course that David Sontag and Pete Solovich are teaching. For some reason, it's not listed yet, but I have many advisees who are petitioning to use it. So absolutely, the, the answer for most of these questions is most likely yes, because of a very easy petition. You know, have a new petitions website that sort of makes it even easier. So the answer is yes. Any other questions? Feel free to jump in. Uh, and then uh, let me dive more into those. So the combio list is uh, this subject, which is the same as that subject, which I'm going to show soon. Then uh, these four, and then uh, the subject that I just mentioned. So the bio RE, the restricted electives, are sort of all of those. And then you just need to take one from all of those. Okay. So let's dive into the computational biology courses. So basically, this is the one that Maxine mentioned earlier. So that's the one I'm teaching, 6047. So uh, this is basically, I think, probably the, bro the, 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 the one with most breadth. So it covers uh, genomics, it covers networks and circuits and systems, it also covers uh, evolution, and it also covers human health. So there's a lot of genetics in there. So, uh, and then the prerequisites for this one are uh, basically probabilities, because we, we do a lot of machine learning, and then uh, algorithms, and of course, just GIR biology. That's the one I mentioned, the, the new one. So basically machine learning for healthcare. This is taught by David Sontag and Pete Solovich. And um, this basically introduces machine learning for electronic health records for sort of patient level data. Evolutionary biology is taught by Bob Berwick and then it introduced, and also um, Mr. MicroRNA guy, David Bartel, of course. Um, so, and David Bartel, and basically introduces a lot of the concepts, models, and computations for evolutionary biology. Then 6802 is uh, deep learning the life sciences. So the, the, this is also listed at 6874. I'm now co-teaching this with David Gifford this term, and then hopefully he'll be co-teaching this with me as well. Uh, this is the course by Bonnie Berger. This is a very, very cool course. It introduces a lot of sort of guest lectures. Uh, every Wednesday, and uh, it sort of teaches you really about the frontiers of computational molecular biology. And this is a new course uh, taught in course one uh, by a new professor, Tammy, who's basically looking at sort of um, genomics and evolution of infectious diseases. Okay, so all of these are listed right now, but again, if there are additional courses that you're interested in, chances are you can petition to anything that sort of lands computational biology. Any questions on these? Yeah. Uh, um, I think uh, I think just one of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 
Captain Orr. I think the style would like go for both Orr and. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, it's weird. Um, yeah, so here there's a parenthesis that that end, and I guess without the parenthesis, it, it's an or. Isn't the English language messy? I mean, everybody should just be programming, seriously. And that's why we have courses. Um, <laughs> all right, any other questions? These are great questions. All right, so, the, the, and, and again, sort of don't feel that this is it. This is just the beginning. That's just the course part. Your undergrad career is so much more richer, so much richer than that, okay? So we have, on one hand, a lot of uh, resources. So on one hand, you have your advisor. That's your number one resource. The better they know you, the more helpful they'll be. So basically just go meet with them, uh, not just on reg day, email them, stop by. They're really uh, friendly, useful, helpful people. And they're, they're there to help. Number two, <laughs> maybe much more importantly, the undergrad office or any kind of, oh, can I petition for this and that? The undergrad office basically sees every single undergrad in every one of our programs, and they know every possible exception that has ever been had for the last many, many years. Okay, so they're the people to talk to. Your advisor only has experience with about 20 or 30 people each year, uh, the undergrad office with 400. So <laughs> they are your go to uh, final answer for everything. And very often in Reg Day, I'm like, hey, Anne, hey, Katrina. All right, so I have a question, and they're like, okay, and immediately have the answer. So it's, it's remarkable. They're amazingly efficient. Uh, there's also an advising forum in Piazza that you can use to sort of get uh, a lot of uh, feedback from other uh, students. And also your living group some, sometimes, basically given how many EDCS students there are, chances are there are some in your living group. So uh, talk to them. There's a lot of uh, outside help. Basically, there's also student support services. So uh, Students very often panic. You're like, oh, um, I, I don't know, I lost my kitty. Or I, uh, you know, my, my, my uncle is sick and I have to go take care of him or something. You know, things happen or my boyfriend or my girlfriend dropped me, uh, dropped me or something. So there's a lot of complexity in the life of a person, especially at your uh, very formative years. And uh, very often students sort of think that they're alone, that they're like, I'll just have to cope with it. No, resources are there to help. So basically, SQ is extremely responsive. Whatever problems you have, just talk to them right away, uh, and then they'll help you. And also, your GRT and your house masters are extremely uh, good resources. And there's a lot of other resources that I mentioned. So check this out. If you're struggling for anything, don't think that this is your fault and this is your problem. You have to take care of it. There's a lot of student groups also within EECS. The, the two major uh, ones are Eta Kappa Nu and Tau Beta Pi, as well as uh, IEEE and ACM. So they're student groups. Uh, sign up. There's, they're really great for uh, connecting students together. There's a lot of uh, career resources. So again, the, this being one of the largest uh, majors in MIT, it is also one of the most coveted at career fairs, one of the most sort of sought after. Um, and then this is you know, very, very uh, important uh, to, to sort of take advantage of these resources. So there's career advising and professional services, there's ICT, there's ACS jobs, uh, there's a lot of student spaces where you can go and meet fellow students. So there's two lounges in building 36 and building 38, which are next to each other. Um, and then there's a lot of opportunity for uh, development beyond that. So basically there's the UGA program for professional development, there's the GEL uh, program for uh, engineering leadership. So I really encourage you guys to look those up and, and learn more. And there's also ways of going beyond MIT to sort of reach out to the whole world. So there's global MIT, where you basically can study abroad in dozens of countries. There's MISTI for, uh, again, international opportunities. And then there's several uh, partnerships with Zurich, with Imperial College, with other places. Um, E ECS is also extremely entrepreneurial, so there's a lot of programs to help with entrepreneurship. So Start MIT is a workshop for uh, entrepreneurs and innovators uh, run during IEP. So they bring in founders of incredibly successful companies who basically meet with you one-on-one, -on -one, give you uh, feedback. There's a Sandbox Innovation Fund, which is basically money to actually go and develop your ideas, create your own startups. We have a lot of new partnerships. Here's one example, J Clinic, they just started. Uh, this was funded by uh, folks listed here. 
and it enables number one technology development for um, uh, for molecules for basically creating new molecules using artificial intelligence a large-scale clinical validation education policy and then supporting entrepreneurship so the goal is to reduce the data needed for training to enable privacy preserving learning for example if you're here at MIT and you want to integrate data from any hospitals how can you do that without moving the data out of the hospital uh, how can you transfer uh, information robustly across diverse populations? How can you increase transparency and also interpretability? You don't want to just say, oh, take the red pill, trust me. You want to say, oh, because I looked at your genomic profile, I looked at your, you know, I don't know, uh, information and so forth. And there's also validation partners, both from pharma and uh, other places, which can basically help uh, validate uh, the predictions. You may have heard about this uh, new thing that's starting at MIT. So MIT has had schools uh, and departments for a long time. We now have a college. <laughs> it's not a school, it's not a department, it's, a, it's something else. So basically the Swarthman College of Computing started with this billion dollar investment uh, from uh, fundraising uh, of which about say 700,000 is already raised. And uh, the goal is to sort of really connect cross uh, cuttingly across MIT. There's going to be a new building, building 45. You can see Stata here. You are now here. And then that's sort of ECS headquarters, 36, 37, 34. Um, 45 is going to be just across the street, right next to the Brain and Cognitive Science, uh, McGovern and Pickover building. And uh, it will be basically housing this uh, both cross-cutting faculty who are going to be hired by different departments and then are sitting all within the same building. And faculty who are only within the Department of Computer Science or basically also in that building. So there's gonna be um, 50 new positions, basically, of which 25 are gonna be core and 25 are gonna be shared. So it has an L structure where there's a vertical component, which is kind of like a school, and then there's a horizontal component, which is cropping across schools. And that's sort of what the um, uh, college computing is. So again, 700 million has already been raised, and uh, this is unprecedented, I think, in the history of computer science. Uh, the three goals are basically supporting rapid growth and evolution of computing fields, notably computer science and artificial intelligence, facilitating computing collaboration, but also focusing on social and ethical responsibility of computing uh, to make sure that when we develop uh, AI, uh, the robots don't take over. <laughs> we kind of have to think about ethics from the beginning. And if, if this is something that's sort of more pervasive in our culture, hopefully our machine, machines will be less nasty than humans are. Um, sorry to be simple. Um, all right, so that's the College of Computing, but that's not the only structure that's sort of partnered with EECS. So basically MIT has this concept of um, the departments that are sort of focused on education, and then cross-cutting with that, the labs that are focused on research. And there are main, uh, five main labs that are sort of associated with EECS. The biggest one is C-cell, and that's probably the one that's the most relevant to you guys if you're interested in computational biology. So basically that's where most of computational research uh, gets done. RLE is more about uh, electronics. MTL is again about microsystems technology. And LID is something that you're uh, probably also very interested in. That sort of decision support, and that just celebrated its uh, 80, 80th anniversary this year. So it was founded exactly 80 years ago. So basically there's a lot of artificial intelligence type stuff going on here and also going on there. Is everybody with me on the labs? So a little bit about the Schwarzman College of Computing. Let's talk a little bit more about C-Sale. So C-Sale has a lot of themes. So vision graphics, human language, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, robotics. And then there's one of these areas that is the most relevant to you guys, which is computational biology. So these are the faculty involved. So David Gifford is doing research in uh, deep learning and computational biology and genomics and more recently uh, designing molecules and so on and so forth. Bruce Dieter is doing research on protein folding uh, in molecule docking in sort of, uh, you know, more on the physics side of things of sort of how our molecules interact with each other. And again, more recently, AI and healthcare, et cetera. Bonnie Berger is doing a lot of research in through mathematical biology and computational biology, looking at um, you know, comparative genomics, looking at uh, systems uh, and networks, and more recently, a lot of single cell uh, data analysis. Ron Weiss is a member of uh, C-Cell, even though he is in biological engineering. So again, this concept of the labs 
and the departments are not always a one-to-one -one match. And he's doing synthetic biology. Uh, I'm an chemist. My research is on genomics uh, and the molecular basis of human health, so basically bridging genetics, epigenomics, circuits, comparative genomics, to basically understand how do you develop schizophrenia? What happens in your brain during aging? What are the genetic differences between us that predispose us to disease? And can we exploit these differences and these mechanisms to basically develop new therapeutics and new targets to manipulate disease? Colin Stoltz is looking at more on the medical side. So, uh, you know, more closely related to IMS, for example, where you can, you can look at human physiology as a system and then, you know, write differential equations to model heartbeats and walking and, you know, all kinds of um, uh, whole organism type diseases. Everybody with me so far? So that's within CSAIL. But within EECS, there's many, many, many faculty involved in this interface between biology and EECS. I mentioned Bob Berwick earlier through his course on um, evolution. So Sangeeta Bhatia is developing all these artificial organs and sort of using those to um, you know, understand biology and physiology. Paulina Goland is looking at vision for medical imaging and how you can actually uh, recognize these images um, you know, systematically through your uh, computer. Um, uh, John Gutek is developing AI models for, um, you know, healthcare and decision support. Uh, to, to, uh, Tomas Mazzano Perez uh, primarily works in robotics, but also does a lot of sort of health-related uh, uh, research. Tim Liu is another synthetic biologist, just like uh, Ron Weiss, and he's looking at sort of bacteria and how we can sort of co-opt them into doing all kinds of really cool and useful things for us. Um, so Jerry Sussman, um, you know, interested in sort of the foundational principles through which, I don't know, light emerges and multicellularity emerges. Peter Solovich, a uh, towering figure in uh, electronic health records and sort of how they can be used to enable better decision support within hospitals. Uh, again, all of the stuff that we do to develop new drug therapeutics uh, pales in comparison to the impact that you can have if uh, the nurses wash their hands a little more often or if, uh, you know, the hospital staff doesn't unplug the ventilator <laughs> when uh, they're done with their shift to plug in the vacuum cleaner and so forth. I mean, stuff that sounds, you know, relatively simple, but can have a humongous impact on human health and delivery. Uh, Caroline Euler is basically looking at machine learning models for uh, health. Um, Tamara Broderick, for example, who's not listed, is again doing a lot of sort of patient modeling and deep learning and uh, that aspect. Um, Regina Barzile, also not listed, uh, has recently shifted her focus from NLP, natural language processing, to cancer and sort of developing therapeutics, developing molecules, using AI to develop uh, sort of small molecules and so forth. Um, this is on, you know, just a bio -X side. This is the biomed side. You can see sort of a lot of the same folks up here, but, you know, uh, different focus area. And then there's the big data area. And then that's sort of where you find Regina. That's where you find Tamara Broderick that I mentioned earlier are both sort of focused on uh, biology. Uh, Tommy Yakola as well, uh, the, you know, a lot of sort of Bayesian models and deep learning, machine learning for uh, biology. And, um, you know, again, the list goes on and on and on. So if you go to the EECS MIT website, you just Google MIT EECS, you can sort of click on faculty and then filter by different areas. And then you'll be able to click on each of their profiles and learn a lot more uh, about the research. Okay. So how do you get involved? There's many programs. On one hand, through classes, you can get to do final projects with those professors and then get to meet them through the classes that they teach. You can then do a Europe with them. Basically, just meet people in their lab and say, hey, you know, how can I get involved? What can I help with? And at different stages in your career, you can have more and more involved projects. And of course, the Super Europe project program, which actually started within EECS, is a program where you get to spend multiple semesters working with the same research group, therefore leading to a larger project, and very frequently an undergrad thesis or a master's thesis. Um, in addition, uh, we have this five-year MEng program. This is extremely helpful because usually when you go off to do your PhD, the first requirement is to do a master's degree. And some people spend you know, two years of intense research doing their master, at which point they're looking for a project that's way, way bigger for their PhD, and that can lead to many, many more years of research. Whereas with the MN program, you get to do a one-year master, which is just an extension of your undergrad. In my case, I did it on the 
second semester of my senior year. And you know, I have some advisees who have done that as well. So it's sort of embedded within your undergrad. And then by the time you get to grad school, you've already got your master's. So then you can immediately focus on the project for your PhD, which is very attractive. 6A, which I also did as an undergrad, is a program that allows you to um, go work at a company. So the third, um, you know, you spend three summers at the company. The first summer, the second summer, you do different projects, maybe the same project building on it. And then the third summer, you also spend a semester there and you get your thesis done. Um, and then again, uh, start with a Europe and then you can build to uh, Super Europe, an event program, 6A program, and so forth. Uh, coming out of ECS, you can get to have a lot of impact um, in, in the world. Who has heard of Khan Academy? Mm, so <laughs> that's uh, Sal Khan. He's, uh, you know, an undergrad from our uh, department. Who has heard of Dropbox? <laughs> so <laughs> these are two people, for, again, from our department who started this. And then uh, who has heard of uh, Black Hole Imaging last year? So again, Katie Bauman uh, came over and uh, actually gave a little salon over at our house uh, last spring. Um, you know, she's uh, using basically computation to sort of better understand imaging and how to do Bayesian learning on image data. Carly Fiona was the CEO of HP. Megan Smith was a VP at Google and it became the third in the history of this country, US Chief Technology Officer. Uh, Ray Stat, I don't know if you've heard about the Stata Center, is the founder of the Analog uh, Devices uh, company, which again has had huge success. Uh, Peter Diamantis, uh, founder of the XPRIZE. Terevin Batsoglu is an undergrad, uh, was an undergrad here at MIT, and uh, he did his PhD as well. And he's a professor of, at Stanford. Now he's leading one of the big sort of discovery groups at Illumina. Andrew Viterbi developed the Viterbi algorithm for HMM training, and he's, he founded Qualcomm. And he's a huge uh, supporter of our department and uh, school. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about Hoffman Coding. So, you know, David Hoffman was in our department uh, founding coding and information theory. So, a lot of really cool things are going on uh, within ECS and uh, this interface of life sciences and computer science. I really encourage you to get involved, learn more, and, um, I'm, I'm, you know, don't, don't lose track of the many, many resources. It can be a little overwhelming. So, I recorded this, conversation, this uh, presentation and we'll put it on. Uh, YouTube and send you a link and then uh, I'll make all the slides available of course to the course staff. So I'm here for questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you may have seen this slide before so I didn't put it here but let me um, bring that up just a sec. All right, so um, within a stone's throw of MIT, if you're a pretty good stone thrower, <laughs> you can hit some of the major uh, bio and pharma companies in the world, okay? So Pfizer, Novartis, Biogen, uh, you know, the giants in the field, Sanofi, uh, Genzyme, um, you know, are all, all within a stone's throw. And the reason for that is not that, I don't know, rent was cheap. <laughs> exactly the opposite. This is the, the most expensive rent in the world. I mean, forget Tokyo and San Francisco. If you have a biotech company, you want to pay the most in the world from here. And the reason why everybody wants to be here is you guys. <laughs> they want to work with MIT students at this interface. So uh, I get emails every few days from another one of my you know, friends or former alumni uh, asking for, uh, you know, hey, do you know any students who are interested in pharma, et cetera? So basically, you know, this is one side, pharma. The second one is uh, just academic research. So basically you can do academic research within academia or you can do academic research in a company. For example, Serafin Batoglu that I mentioned earlier is now leading uh, uh, an academic group within Illumina, the biggest citizen company in the world. Why? It's, it's very cool. They want to collaborate. And they're like, oh, we want to publish everything. We don't want to patent anything. We want to make everything freely available. I'm like, 
what's your business model? Well, the more we convince people that sequencing is useful, the more sequencing machines we're going to sell. <laughs> so their goal is to show that sequencing is valuable. So, you know, this is just some of the examples. So basically, but with the techniques that you're going to learn at this interface of sort of big data applied to biology, you can then go into any career with big data applied to almost any applied field. Because you learn how to deal with noisy data. You learn how to deal with sort of stochasticity. You learn how to build robust models. You learn how to do sampling. You learn how to do applied AI. So all of these things at this interface of 6, 7 and by, you know, computer science and biology could serve as computer science and anything else, or biology and anything else. This whole concept of having a quantitative field and a scientific field is something that is pervasive in science. And sort of learning how to be a true interdisciplinary scientist is extremely, uh, you know, important and useful for anything. So, does that answer your question? Did you have any other careers in mind that I haven't mentioned? Yeah, so I'm thinking that people that actually say So absolutely, basically, I have two MDs who are in my lab right now. I'm basically the mentor of their K awards, and they're seeing patients during the week. And on Thursday, they're, uh, I mean, seeing me, <laughs> which is great because they're psychiatrists, so it's kind of help. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, they, they are, again, at this interface of sort of working with patients, but also revolutionizing healthcare and how we think about the very disorders that they're dealing with. We collaborate a lot with medical doctors at MGH, and you know we, we work with surgeons who are sort of you know gathering samples and working with us on the analysis of those samples, uh, with people who actually see patients and who study electronic health records, etc. And uh, this is something where their trainees, their doctor trainees, very often come spend time in my group to sort of learn more about computer science. And sort of doing that as part of your undergrad can be extremely helpful because, frankly, uh, there's no profession that does not require data mining nowadays. And sort of having the mindset of sort of understanding data, understanding the noise in data, understanding the weirdnesses and biases and batch effects, etc., cetera, uh, is something that you're going to learn in this program and is going to be useful whatever career you choose, including medical work. Any other careers that you guys have in mind? Yeah, yeah, so I'm actually a software and I want to be research mainly, but I'm uh, like trying to do MD PhD. So you're not alone in being a six seven who wants to do that too. Like, and it's also pretty easy to do all your pre med requirements because most of them are included in the six seven like curriculum. So more for a MD, like it works and it has long term benefits. And uh, again, I, I didn't mention the HST program, also related to IMS. I sort of mentioned it briefly. It's basically a program that's joint between MIT and Harvard that basically allows you to sort of get your MD and your PhD at the same time. So basically students in that program, for example, come and do research in your group for one year and then go off and do their medical research, uh, their, their medical training, and then they come back and then continue their research. So it's kind of a mix of the two, which is dramatically abridged compared to doing a PhD and an MD and sort of uh, combines, I think, the best of both worlds. Not for the faint of heart. Maybe <laughs> I realized I actually enjoy coding, and although like at times it's like intimidating, like you actually, I realized I was able to do more than I thought. And so I was like, wow, like, I can, this is a really great tool that I can think of. And um, so I think that was a significant factor. And my work is in like research, which is like a blog note, but there's lots of cool research like that at MIT in the 6th 7th field, like that I'm interested in the 6th 7th. And I've 
enjoyed it because it, it kind of gets to do a lot of different things that are connected to each other. So even though like you're doing individual science things or quantitative things, it's towards the same goal. So it doesn't feel scattered, but it feels like that is you and you know, that are doing the science. Uh, I guess I can answer the same question you just are not. So I kind of came from like the opposite angle. Uh, in high school, I did a lot of like biology and biology research, and I also did some bioinformatics. So then coming into MIT, I also took 600 and realized that yes, I really do like computer science, and I do want to pursue like both. Uh, and the thing I like about 6-7 is that there's a spectrum. Like of course, you have to fulfill the main requirements, but there is some flexibility on whether you want to be a more sick. Six seven or more seven six seven in terms of like what electives you take. Uh, so I like that, and also um, I like that they're kind of very different approaches. So you learn very different ways of thinking that at the same time synergize. So for example, in I'm only a sophomore, so I've only taken like your foundational courses. But in O four two and double six, you learn a lot about like logic and how to think very clearly about things and not make any assumptions. And that's actually like the same underlying skill that you apply in experimental biology, where you, you see what information you have at hand. You don't want to make any assumptions. So then you ask the next question and basically see how you can prove something in a different setting. But I feel like they really reinforce each other, and it's really fun to have two very different styles of classes. What's really remarkable is, again, across so many disciplines, we need that way of thinking, the way of sort of being both quantitative and applied because we're dealing with problems in the real world. And um, I, I should also mention that sort of our EECS department has traditionally had these two components of sort of EE and CS and EECS. But now with 6.7 and 6.14, you can see that the structure is kind of exploding. The other thing that's happening is that even the EECS core itself is now broken into three components. There's the traditional CS, the traditional EE, and then there's a new AIND which is basically artificial intelligence and uh, basically decisions, uh, which is applied data science, basically. And that sort of uh, took components both from CS and from EE within the, in the department. Again, as I mentioned, Liz earlier is uh, very related to that. Um, and it's a whole you know, foundation pillar of the EECS and the School of Computing right now. So it's, it's worth recognizing that uh, the skills that you're going to learn in computation biology are going to be applicable to such a diversity of fields, whether you basically look at mining social data from Facebook or from Twitter or looking at, I don't know, uh, socioeconomic data across different countries and how that's you know, changing or environmental uh, data from climate change, et cetera. All of that is you know, very heavily related to it. Other uh, questions? Seems like we have another question. Uh, yeah, well, Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, even within my lab, I mean, we do a lot of electronic health record map modeling and stuff like that. So, you know, there's a lot to be done in sort of understanding what is the model predicting, sort of refining the model, learning how to do training. Um, there's, I mean, David Sontag and Pitsolovich are also great resources in the electronic health record space. Uh, and then Colin Stoltz, as I mentioned earlier, sort of in this whole medical arena. But again, among the uh, faculty that I showed earlier, if you go within the uh, ECS website, you can kind of see um, Yeah, I, I guess this would be, you know, a good list of candidates for this whole sort of medical intersection. So we're going to go around the room and everybody's going to have to ask a question. Okay, so I'm going to give, uh, you know, some freebies, which is the people who are going to raise their hand, but then get ready. We're going to go this way. Okay, so go ahead. You can start taking your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, very important question. So 
you were talking about careers, sort of what are, what are the options coming out of this program? And one of the options is absolutely policy. I mean, there's of course the TPP program, the Technology and Policy Program at MIT. We also have a lot of close affiliation with Sloan. For example, um, Andrew Law uh, is a member of CSAIL and a professor over at Sloan. He did his career in sort of finance, and now he's interested in sort of new financing model for models for healthcare research. So uh, you, within, within IMES, there's a lot of uh, sort of folks who are thinking about sort of hospital policy and sort of, you know, really policy at the, at the country level. And uh, I think through a lot of the clinical collaborators that we have, there's a lot of opportunity there. So there's absolutely a lot of, a lot of sort of career paths that can get you that, in that way. And there's plenty of courses at MIT that can help you to think sort of earth level uh, problems such as climate change, such as, you know, how do we reinvent the healthcare system? How do we reinvent the way that pharmaceutical discovery is being financed? Instead of sort of thinking of the traditional sort of um, blockbuster drug model, companies are now having to reimagine the way that they're going to be financing their uh, R&D program. And the way to do that is uh, really to uh, sort of rethink it from the ground up at a, at a societal level. So, extremely important. Does that answer your question? Do you have any follow-up? Follow yeah. Hey, does anyone do work in like agriculture? So, um, not, not within my lab. I've been approached by several sort of pharma at the intersection of agriculture and genomics. Um, there's definitely a huge impact there in terms of making biofuels, in terms of making better crops, in terms of you know improving the health uh, and uh, you know reducing the cost while making the quality, etc. Extremely important area. Uh, I can look up some folks if you're if you're interested. Uh, to get back to you. All right. Uh, what would be the advantages of doing the six seven later over course seven with the mind? Uh, it's a question that gets so much, and the, the, the question is more broadly, is it easier to sort of add biology to computing, or is it easier to add computing to biology? I'm biased, because I started from computing, but a lot of people that I interact with tell me the same thing, that sort of having quantitative thinking, and sort of deep learning, machine learning, and all of the Bayesian inference models, etc., is something that is very hard to learn later on. Yes, if you do primarily biology and then you tag on computer science, you're going to be able to write scripts. You're going to be able to use programs, and that's going to be great. But will you invent the next methodology or the next set of machine learning models? Probably not. Uh, conversely, uh, the folks who have truly an undergrad biology training rather than just pure machine learning and then they add that in biology, they, they're not able to ask the really deep questions. When something doesn't match their data, they're like, oh, it's probably my, my mistake. They don't have the click to say, oh, wait, maybe my, my textbook was wrong, <laughs> which is extremely powerful and empowering for the folks who have truly done biology from the beginning. So my advice would be uh, six plus seven. It's probably easier on the brain, and it's easier in your career and sort of your way of thinking, because I think it's nice to have both early on, and it's very formative, but having a strong computational core would be my preference for at least a lot of the problems that I tackle. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sir. still do six seven which is mostly bio uh, and with much more flexibility than just seven plus mine yeah. yeah um so i like something i've heard from people who have like who are in six seven right now they're like who have like gone through six seven and are at like the end of their like, undergraduate career is kind of like a feeling like potentially that they didn't get enough, like, of either six or seven. So I guess I, like, my kind of thing is, like, the same, so, like, a similar concern is, like, um, 
I guess, like, first off, like, what happens after the like, yeah. entire yeah. year and decide, like, oh, like, you know, sex isn't really for me. Like, I, I just want to, like, focus on biology. Yeah. Like, but you missed out on, like, the opportunity to go, like, yeah. further in depth with that. So and, it's like, such a great question. I mean, I'm, I'm so glad you guys are doing this because these are phenomenal questions. So basically, my advice would be uh, don't think of the checking of the requirements as the goal. Think of it as the bare minimum. And then you can sort of strengthen your buyer, you can strengthen your CS with additional stuff. So, uh, you know, when, when I was an undergrad, 6 7 didn't exist. I just did all my six requirements and then I just sat in on all of the bio classes just because I wanted to. So basically, I didn't feel I was missing out. And I, I sort of had role models who were both conversant in both and role models who were conversant in only one. And I was like, no, I want to be bilingual. So I sort of really dove deep into the biology to, to sort of be conversant. And when I speak with people, they often ask me, hey, what's your actual background? Is it bio or CS? And for me, that's the most flattering question. I'm like, cool, I, you couldn't tell. Uh, because we sort of, I can dive into the biology with very great detail, or I can dive into machine learning with very great detail. So I, you know, basically, it really helps to go beyond just the core minimum to sort of push either side. And I think the advantage of a flexible major is that you have this extra room to sort of go deep into the areas that you care the most about. Don't exploit it to, to, take, to take the least. Exploit it to sort of tune it to the depth that you're the most interested in. Does that answer your question? mention is, you know, gosh, it's a little weird seeing us twice. Um, uh, maybe we should stop the projection. There you go. Um, so, there you go. Um, so the, um, the other thing to, to, to sort of uh, build on that is I have a student who basically, an advisee, who announces to me on Reg Day that he's going to change majors and he's going to sort of spend these three semesters leading up to this world's most awesome class. And I'm like, you know what? That class is being taught right now. Go listen in this week and then come back and tell me. So, so she went in and listened. He's like, oh gosh, I, I don't really, I really don't want to do that. So uh, uh, basically the advice that I would give you is don't sort of plan your entire career thinking that you're going to love something that in the end might end up not being the case. Try it in a summer internship. Try it in IAP. Try it by sort of taking a really advanced course as a listener or just listening in or just watching it online. And then that can sort of jump the gun on maybe two, three years of preparation to say, oh, actually, that's not what I thought it was going to be. And also one more thing. Uh, what people told me when I, I had like the same question uh, between six, seven and seven, um, but people told me that undergrad is for getting breadth. Grad school is for getting the depth more. So don't worry if you feel like you're not an expert in either one. It's, it, again, sort of getting your mindset, your basically formative critical years of your way of thinking about the world, getting older size, in my view, is much more important than sort of going really, really deep at this stage. All right, continue. I think you've asked the question before, but you can ask another. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, you haven't, sorry. Oh, yeah, I have. Um, I have two questions, one from probably more to the school setting, um, which is, so you mentioned in a response to an earlier question that there are a lot of kind of opportunities like, like industry opportunities in this area. So how do you recommend getting in touch with the kind of It's a great that? question. So in some cases, they sponsor fellowships. In other cases, they have career fairs where they sort of come um, with local staff. And uh, the third axis is obviously the faculty. So, you know, I have alumni from my research group who are now in basically all the major pharma. So <laughs> chances are I know someone in there who can then connect you to the right people. Uh, and chances are this is the same for many of the faculty that you interact with. 
So my advice would be uh, go on LinkedIn and look at sort of who are people that you have one off connection with in that company and then go talk to those people and say, hey, what do you know about such and such? Can you introduce me, et cetera? Uh, this is so much more powerful than just sending your CV through the trade I mean, through the, through the main website. Uh, Maxine, why don't you come and join us as well? <laughs> Uh, we see, I think a lot of departments also have a point person who keep, keeps record of where the alumni are. And so you could go to this person and say, hey, do we have any alumni at Novartis? And then if you had a specific name and you say, oh, I'm in the same program as you were a few years ago, that's really, they don't usually have to sort of, I think, pay attention to your email. All right, last round. Back. Okay. Um, uh, 6.9 is not there yet, is it? It is now? Yeah, 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 awesome. So uh, it depends what you want to do. So basically, if you just want to do AI, 6. If you want to do neuroscience, 6.9. Uh, can you throw your question real quick or no? Yeah. Yeah. It's such a great question. You should look at the curricula for both and then sort of look at the small number of differences because it's only a small number of differences. And chances are that as part of your 6 7, you could actually petition to take a lot of 20 classes. So you could actually make a 20 like six, seven. Next. Yep. Um, I was kind of wondering, like, in terms of career paths for six, seven majors, um, like, what is the breakdown with wet lab type work? So, like, because I'm more interested in wet lab, I would say. Yeah. So, like, so you should realize that wet lab is no longer one factor at a time. Sometimes yeah. it's seven million measurements in one experiment. So something that I would really encourage you to do is sort of think about what is the next generation high throughput large scale experiments, and then you will realize the importance of machine learning and data science for integrating the results of that experiment. So the impact that you can have with these high throughput experiments is so much faster than with the traditional biology. So if you like wet lab, you're in for a treat because at this interface of computation and biology, in my own lab, for example, we've done, you know, in inventing new technologies for doing these millions of experiments, measurements in a single experiment. So um, usually it's seen sort of this genomics, data science kind of lab that invent these new technologies because we have that mindset. So it's not a bad major for that either. I actually have two questions. The first one is how did you choose your reminders? And two, there's a lot of uh, successfully uh, seniors have used your events. It's, a, it's more of the exception and don't rush it. There's really no reason to rush it. Like enjoy MIT because it's an awesome place and you know postpone it as much as you can and learn as much as you can. What would be my advice? Uh, I think my advice is um, actually like it's kind of weird this reason because I wanted to do MD PhD so I took um, Sanjita Padilla for six and not Becca Hayden for seven because they're both MD PhD and I want your advice. But also, I really uh, was interested in the research. Awesome. Thank you guys. Feel like you learned something? Yeah. Awesome. Great.